Uh, we're going to be now diving into chapter two of Shar Hayichud Vemuna, which is the gateway to um, unity and faith in God. Uh, here it gets very analytical in, a, in, in really a beautiful way. It's like uh, it's like an, an, an indulgence for the mind. Uh, but because we, it's been a couple of weeks since we studied because of um, a couple of weeks off, um, where we left off last uh, session, last study, was just the practical lessons. If you're looking in the Kindle, and no pressure if you don't have um, it in the book, but in the Kindle, the way they um, uh, the way they do the practical lessons, they only do it at the end of the chapter. So at the end of chapter one is where all the practical lessons are. So what I'm going to do first is actually just read all the practical lessons that came through chapter one. I think it'll just be a, a good review uh, before we get into chapter two. So it's 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 just the enjoyable part where we get the practical lessons. In the book, it actually just has them interspersed throughout the chapter as it came along. But in the Kindle, they actually save it for some reason uh, till the end. So we're just going to read. It'll just give us a good summary also of what we studied in chapter one by um, looking at the um, at the practical lessons. Then Yaakov, I love your t-shirt. I, I just saw it as you sat down. It's a, it's a good one. <laughs> What's I like it. it. Let's see it. Oy vey. Good. <laughs> That's really good. All right, here we go. While they are recorded just once in the Torah, God's 10 creative statements are uttered continuously to endow the universe with existence. So this was the um, incredible contribution from Hasidus that, and, and let's just take a step back, not just that God created the world, the contribution of Chassidus is that the, the creation is constant, that it's not just a one-time event. Every moment, the world is being recreated. And how are they being recreated? Through the words that God used to create um, the world. Um, a couple of weeks ago, before we ended, um, uh, we took, before we took our two-week break, I sent an email with a link to Chabad.org that has um, almost like a cartoon, but it's it's a very deep, it's called Kabbalah Tunes, where this idea was brought out, where you see the um, um, the idea of, of the words that God used, the 10 utterances, as the letters behind everything in creation, as the vitality, the fuel behind everything in creation. If God's creative statements would stop, even for a moment, the universe would cease to exist. That was the next big contribution, that it's constant. And if it would stop, it would cease to exist. So look at the world as a vibrant, pulsating garment of the divine. When you look at the world and you appreciate creation, you're actually appreciating God because God is constantly involved in creation. God's creative energy in the form of letters is downgraded through switching and exchanging letters. Um, so that's how uh, the creation happens every moment. And there's a switch and a, co a connection between all the letters to create everything in the universe. So as to be compatible with the universe, each created thing has its own unique code of letters. The more switching exchanging takes place, the more the energy in the letters is diminished through this process. The divine presence that fills the world has millions of different faces. The majesty and oneness of God are manifest in the most basic and simple types of being including dirt and stone. So in everything, um, you could see the oneness of God. The simplest things, when appreciated with reverence, can take on an entirely new meaning. The final code of divine letters, which powers an object, is in fact its name in Hebrew. So and it, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. We always want to know people's Hebrew names. And if they don't want to have one, we try to give them one because there's something powerful or even somewhat magical in the code of the divine letters, which is the Hebrew alphabet. Um, so everything in creation has um, a Hebrew name, which is its definition, not only as explaining what it is, but explaining its life mission. Um, so everything from a horse to a stone to obviously a person has... Um, has deep significance based on their Hebrew. So for example, even if you take the word Adam, which in Hebrew is Adam, which was the name of the first person, um, there's different reasons of why he was given that name of Adam. A simple one is Adam comes from the word of Adame, which means similar or compared to. A human is supposed to be Adame Le'elyon, which is similar 
or um, um, a replica of of godly uh, a godly being, a, a divine being. So, and really, most of the sefirot that we know of, when we talk about the human body, it's all in a relationship to how um, a, a godly existence is. And we say um, in sefira we have the ability of of kindness of God, which is the right side. So, the right side of a person is more in tune with kindness, and we give charity with our right hand. Chesed and Very good, Chesed and Gevura. Uh, it's all based on the fact that Adam or a human is compared or similar to um, uh, divine, which is what we say in the Torah, uh, that um, in the image of God, B'Tselem Elohim. Um, uh, yeah. So Adam was given the task of naming all the animals. Mm -hmm. And so if he was divinely inspired, he was given the name Adam. Did he receive divine inspiration to name the animals? Yeah. He brings. Yeah. And like I mentioned in a story a couple of weeks ago, when someone once came in front of the Rebbe and asked, what should they name their child? The Rebbe's answer was to them, I can't do that. You're you're the parents. You have that divine, or Ruach HaKodesh, that divine intuition that gives you the inspiration of what to name your child. It comes from, it has to come from the parents. So similar to that, um, the inspiration that Adam had came from, from God, um, but then he was able to name all of creation. Contemplate the energy and shape of the letters of your Hebrew name. They manifest a unique expression of God's energy within you. The letters of the Torah have creative power because the Torah and God are one, meaning it's coming from God. And the Torah letters that God used to create the world, the ten utterances, it's giving us the creative power because it's coming from God. Don't look at the Torah as a mere storybook or body of law. It is nothing less than the name of God himself, divine energy, arranged in letter packets. And I love that one. I don't think I read that one before. Is that all the way at the end of the book? So I may, I don't even think I, I think I rushed through the end of chapter one. So I don't think I got to that um, last one, which is a really nice one. I have a question. Yeah, sure. That's so what about, sharing. what about the thousands upon thousands of creatures that Adam did not name were for, for which there were no Hebrew names? Right. How do we account for them? What do you, what do you and, think? And, and, and creatures we're discovering now, unless yeah. you want to say fish to encompass the million kinds of fish, you know, or all the little, the creatures that live within our gut or the fish's gut. Right. You know, the things that so, Israelis didn't know about 3,000 years ago. How do we account for that? And how would you answer the question? How would you account for it? Meaning if you were answering, how would you answer it? Me? How would I answer yeah. it? Yeah. Um, the only way I could think of is to say that, like I said, maybe maybe Adam just said fish for everything with fins, you know, or mammals for every mammal. But he didn't know about... Um, every detail. Creation, he didn't know right. about what was going on in Australia. He didn't know about right. kangaroos. Right. Right. So... Um, I'm just going to pull back the the screen because this was touched. I'm just going to pull the screen up again. This was touched in the chapter, um, and it would be just looking at the practical lessons. It would be over here. The more switching, exchanging, I don't know if you can see my mouse hovering over it. Yes. The yes. more switching, exchanging takes place, the more the energy in the letters is diminished. Through this process, the divine presence that fills the world has millions of different faces. So everything was accounted for. Not necessarily did Adam name everything, and not uh, Adam did not name everything, but yet everything through um, the, uh, mil millions of different combinations that are made, everything is accounted for uh, from the Hebrew letter. So everything has, um, you know, and I don't remember the the source, but it does talk about that Adam named things that, with a general name, and then there's branches of it. So let's say fish. Adam didn't name every type of fish. Adam gave it the basic name of Doug, and then the sub names are all um, you know given later. But it's all from that root. Everything has their root. So it's almost similar to um, if you talk about souls. There's the root souls, and then there's all these subdivisions of that soul. So. We're not going to get too much into reincarnation now, but a person could have a soul that was, you know, already here, and it's just a subdivision of a root soul. So everything has a root name, a root source, 
and Adam named those. And then there could be branches or div, um, subdivisions of it um, that you know, came later or were only found later. But it's all coming from that root that Adam named originally, from that combination originally. Yes, Ava. Yes, Chava. Actually, I think Yaakov had his hand up before me. I'm sorry, I didn't pay attention. Yep, go ahead, Yaakov. Um, I remember my uncle telling me a story about uh, uh, how uh, every creature came and presented themselves before Adam. Yeah. Okay. And so that's, that's, that, that's when he named them, regardless of anything, because over the thousands of years, there's been many cultures... And we've forgotten so many. Even Hebrew was a dead language for the longest time. Nobody right, even knew. Jews were speaking Aramaic for a while, right? Right, right. Until <laughs> until uh, later on, it was brought back to to our remembrance, and we learned it again. Same with the 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 fish, right? There's many fish that they're finding now, but that doesn't mean that at one time they didn't present themselves before Adam to be named. Well, there's That's but there's still whole classes of creatures that that Adam couldn't have named because nobody knew about them till a hundred years ago, like bacteria. There are thousands of kinds of bacteria, so we can't right. say that Adam of said course. such and such means bacteria. Now we get to divide yeah. it into ten thousand kinds. Right. right. He didn't know about he didn't know about amoebas. He didn't but, know. But I think I mentioned beings. I'm saying what would you say? Yeah. They're not sentient beings. I know, but Adam's I, doing more than just naming sentient beings. Fish are not sentient. Nothing sentient, really, other than us and cats. <laughs> yeah, let's hear it, Steve. What do you What do you have to add, Steve? I think it might be easier to understand the divine letters in modern terminology as DNA. We use these letters to describe all the forms of life. It's the science's ways of of uh, simplifying the divine creation of the letters, but we all accept the fact that everything is created of DNA. No, no, it's not true. Some things excuse are created me, excuse of me, RNA. Excuse me, excuse me, we don't, okay, have RNA, they're all letters. These are all attributes or images, scientific images of the divine letters. And so if you can understand that, like science says, everything is pulsing in and out of physical existence, just like, like just like, it's it's written and also we in the science world says everything is composed of these letters we call them dna or rna but we could we could expand our consciousness a little bit and understand them as divine letters and then it all makes sense yeah, there's no awesome. question that i like that that's good you know yeah, it, i like it, that too. i like it too but in a way it's too facile no it's actually 100 percent accurate so it's just that if yeah, you if you spend some more time with it It'll digest it, and I think you'll feel a little more comfortable with it. Okay, I'll right. think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right, and let's hear Ava. So if Hashem gave the names to Adam, and Hashem is also constantly recreating our world in every moment, so that's how these new beings are still being, perhaps still being created, still being discovered, and essentially, Hashem is still naming them, right? If very we nice because it that way, <laughs> to right? Bring because it back the letters the are constantly. That's very nice because the letters are constantly active in creation, and therefore, even well, would 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 you say that there is new beings, or would you say that everything that exists now was there, just we didn't know about it, or was only discovered later? But they could have been named at least by Hashem, even if Adam, you know, wasn't wasn't able to name them their name was already known to God from before. It was just only discovered to us or, yeah. But it, I like that perspective, Chava. Both yeah. both ways make sense. It's it's kind of the same thing. Very nice. All right. With that, we're going to get into chapter two of, of Shari Yichid Vemuna. It's really, it's it's rather, it's shorter. Um, the, these chapters in general are shorter than in the 53 chapters of the first section. Um, Shari Yichid Vemuna, the gates of uh, uh, unity and faith, in God is known for their incredible depth that the Alter Rebbe is taking us through more the mind than the emotion. So the first section of Tanya was more about the heart, disciplining the heart, um, uh, uh, taming the heart um, with emotions and meditation that the mind uses in order to control the heart. But now the, the second section is much more in the mind. In in the um, okay, so let me start like this. In 1960. 
um, it was a special year by the Rebbe because the Rebbe was celebrating 200 years from the yard site of the Baal Shem Tov. So the Baal Shem Tov, whose name was Israel or Israel, he was born in 1698 in Poland, Ukraine, and he died in 1760. One of the in incredible um, uh, um, uh, visions that the, that the Baal Shem Tov himself described was a Rosh Hashanah um, that he he felt his neshama going up to heaven, and he found himself, his soul found himself, herself in a conversation with Mashiach, where he asked Mashiach, when are you coming? And the famous answer he was given, Baal Shem Tov's soul was given, was, when your wellsprings spread forth to the outside, then Mashiach will come. So the Baal Shem Tov's main mission or mandate that he felt he was charged with was to teach the deepest parts of Torah, which is the wellsprings, the source, um, and teach that not only to the internal scholars, but to share that with the world. And therefore, he would travel all over to Shtetelach, everywhere, and teach deep parts of Torah. That's really be That really became the mission of Chabad, of Hafatza, which is to spread the message of, of Torah to the outside. So in in uh, in commemoration of 200 years from the art side of the Baal Shem Tov, the Rebbe was coming up with different projects. And the Rebbe, if I'm not mistaken, even asked Hasidim to present projects of how to honor the Baal Shem Tov on his 200th yard site by uh, coming up with different ways of spreading Hasidus, innovative ways of spreading Hasidus. In general, the Rebbe was um, uh, the Rebbe was very into dates. So whether it was commemorating a 50 year or 100 year or 150 years or 200 years, the Rebbe was always looking into celebrating um, a, 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 um, a milestone year, if that makes sense. So in honor of 200 years, one of the ideas presented, and the Rebbe really went with it, was to be able to teach Tanya on the radio. If now I don't know if any if cars even have radios anymore because it's it seems so old. But in, in 1960, radios was obviously very common, very very uh, standard. And um, but the idea of sharing Torah on the radio was something incredibly novel or or different. And the, the Rebbe actually got tremendous pushback to this idea of teaching Torah on a radio. But the Rebbe loved the idea. And starting in 1960, commemorating the 200th yard site of the Baal Shem Tov, there was a Tanya class on the radio that was given by a chassid whose name was Rabbi Weinberg. Now, Rabbi Weinberg, I, I actually got to know him a little bit um, because he was sent by the previous Rebbe in 1940, 1941, as a shliach to Montreal, Canada. Mm -hmm. He came from Shanghai. He spent the. He was a, a, a survivor that lost many, many of his family members, and he he came to Montreal together with eight colleagues by the previous Rebbe to set up uh, Judaism in 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 Montreal. The Chabad in, in Montreal was started by these nine shluchim, nine uh, uh, messengers of the of the previous Rebbe in 1941. He later became a world traveler on behalf of the Rebbe, which means he traveled to, and he, he made connections, and he made Hasidim all over the world. I'm talking about in little tiny countries and cities in Africa and other places that he was almost the Rebbe's representative to the world. He also, before the war, he studied in the Chabad Yeshiva in the original places, in, in Europe, in, in Lubavitch, and later in when in Poland when when the war started, <clears throat> so he his teachers of Tanya were some of the top mentors of Chabad before the war, so he was definitely trained in Tanya well. And um, actually, I was I was uh, parenthetically I was born in Vancouver, and his Rabbi Weinberg's son was the is is still the the first Chabad rabbi in Vancouver. So his father would come. To visit Vancouver and other places where 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 his children are now Chabad emissaries, so I got to know Rabbi Weinberg a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so in 1960, a Tanya class began on the radio in Yiddish. Now nowadays, Yiddish most people won't be listening to Yiddish on the radio, but in New York in 1960, 
Yiddish was a very, it was almost like a second language in New York, where there was, if you look in the Lower East Side, there was like signs um, uh, on the, the, the signs on stores was actually written up in Yiddish. There was a daily Yiddish newspaper that was very common because of the tremendous Yiddish um, influence and Yiddish speakers uh, that came over from from Europe. My parents so, were my parents were um, Yiddish speakers in, really? from New York City. Right. Okay. There you go. So um, so there was actually a Tanya Shear that was started in 1960 in Yiddish, and it was every Saturday night. And what was unique about this Tanya class? First of all, it took 20 years. Um, you know, our Tanya class um, uh, to do 53 chapters took around four years. But over here to go through the whole Tanya, so that's the five volumes, we're in the middle of the second volume, it took 20 years. So I think we're just around on the same pace. <laughs> and um, but what was unique is the Rebbe himself would listen to this Tanya class on the radio. Every Saturday night, the Rebbe would tune in. And the Rebbe sometimes out of Fabringen would comment on it later on something that was said. In 1980, if I'm not mistaken, when the Tanya class finished, the Rebbe actually made a celebration at the Fabringen to celebrate the completion of the Tanya on the radio. Mm. What's crazy about this class is in advance of the teaching, Rabbi Weinberg's Tanya class, mm. in advance of him giving the class on the radio, it was obviously live, it was on air, um, it wasn't pre-recorded. So the Rebbe wanted a transcript of every word that was going to be shared. So in advance of the class, it had to be prepared word for word of how it's going to be shared so the Rebbe could make corrections. So those corrections are just incredible because the Rebbe never taught Tanya line by line inside. The Rebbe gave teachings of Tanya. But over here, we got a transcript from Rabbi Weinberg writing down his words and the Rebbe either crossing out or correcting or adding or taking out um, uh, parts of the Tanya to make sure it's it's in line with how the Rebbe wants it to be taught. So the actual teaching of the Tanya on the radio, we actually have in a, in a book. Um, it's called Lessons in Tanya. It was originally in Yiddish, Shiurim of Tanya it was is the Yiddish, but then Rabbi Weinberg's sons actually translated it into English. So the first, or not the first, but one of the best translations of Tanya we've had for years it's called Lessons in Tanya. Some of you are probably familiar with the book. I have it on the shelf somewhere here, probably in that room. And you probably are familiar with what it looks like. It has a picture of the Alter Rebbe on the outside. It's like a yellow. Let me just pull it out. I'll be back. No? Okay, let me pull I'll pull it out. You'll be like, oh, I'm right. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That looks yeah. um, so it's a five-volume set, and it looks like this, Lessons in Tanya. Um, and from, for years, this was the main translation of Tanya. So the reason why I'm sharing this background is in Chapter 2 of Shar Hayichur Vemuna, it was a very, um, not complicated, but it's a deep subject that Rabbi Weinberg you know, wrote his transcript, and we have the Rebbe's corrections of how it should be given over. We have some questions that Rabbi Weinberg asked and the answer that the Rabbi gave him to explain the chapter. So that's really what I'm going to be going through, really as an intro to the chapter. Some of it will sound a little esoteric. Um, and really, when we learn it inside through our um, through our practical Tanya, I think it will really come to life. But I just want to give you the background so at least you get a taste of it before we study it inside. Any questions so far? Okay, cool. So in the last chapter, we had the revolution in the first chapter of, of the second section, Shari Yichud Vamuna, the gateway of unity of faith. We had a revolutionary idea and a contribution of, of the Tanya was about God and creation. What we learned is, obviously, we know from before Tanya that God is indivisible, God is infinite, and God is a creator. But what we learned and what we know from before is God is not just an organizer. God didn't, which is how other people would view creation of God, is that God just brought things together. And, and you could go back to the recording of lesson one if, if, um, if you need more help on that. 
but we learned that God is the creator. He created something from nothing, or what we the Latin term was ex nihilo. In Hebrew, that was yesh me'ayin. He created something from nothing. So there was nothing, and God made something out of nothing. And that's only within the realm of create, creator to be able to do that. The Baal Shem Tov added, and then this was the contribution of the Baal Shem Tov or the Tanya and Hasidus, if, is that if God is a creator from nothing to something, it necessitates constant creation. That's what we learned about in chapter one, that God needs to constantly create in order for creation to continue. And if God would cease creation, creating for a moment, which means if the letters that God used to create the world would remove themselves, would be removed by God from the creation, it would turn back, it would revert back to absolute nothingness. That was chapter one. Well, we came to two conclusions, What two conclusions that come out of this uh, revolutionary idea is that God is deeply or or personally involved in every detail of creation. In Hebrew, the term was hashkacha pratis, which means God's intimate or personal orchestration of everything that's happening in the world. Because God didn't just leave the world on its own. God is involved in the world, and God is involved, therefore, in every detail of the world. Um, and it also leads to the conclusion that God creates miracles in the world also. And the reason why we have that conclusion is if God creates the world constantly and is supervising every detail and doesn't step away from creation, then God also makes changes when God feels it's necessary. We refer to them as miracles. It just means a change of the nature. So since God is deeply involved in creation, at times God changes um, the nor the normal order of creation, and that's what we believe as miracles. So we have just the, the general idea again, is that pre chassidus we accept God, meaning before Tanya, we already accept God as infinite, as indivisible, and as a creator. Chassidus adds that God is a constant creator. It's a happy creation is happening constantly, and the result of that is the belief in. God's the, um, um, personal supervision and orchestration of the world in Hebrew is Sashkach Pratis, and the belief in miracles. So that was chapter one in a nutshell. Chapter one is basically facts. That's Tanya telling us how create. That's that's what is creation. It's a constant creation. But now in chapter two, the Alter Rebbe is going to actually bring us proof for this premise. Chapter one was the facts. Chapter two, God, the Alter Rebbe will now prove it. And it's it's really cool with how the Alter Rebbe proves it. He actually will say the claim of the heretics or the philosophers and then rebut it. So before we get into that, um, we could already just learn a beautiful lesson from the order of how the Alter Rebbe puts it. He doesn't bring the, bring the argument and then disprove it and bring his claim he first starts with the facts, the way it is in Torah. And then he'll bring an argument and disprove it. And so I guess what I want to bring out first is Torah is not only a lesson of instruction, even just the order of Torah, you could already have instruction from how things are placed in the Torah. And the Rebbe would, would oftentimes um, uh, mention this in different parts of the Torah, of, of why things are in a certain sequence, even if historically it would be out of order. Things in the Torah not necessarily go in order of how it happened in history. And the, the Rebbe would learn lessons of why the Torah places it in this order. So over here also, the Rebbe would bring a lesson, the fact that the Alter Rebbe explain, um, tells us the facts in chapter 1, and only then in chapter 2 tells us the uh, the count the the other the other um, uh, the philosopher the heretics uh, claim and then rebut it is in the way we work in Torah is based on faith. We also need logic 
and logic is very important, but that's only after we have the foundation of faith. So first, the Alter Rebbe lays down the facts of Torah in chapter one. This is the facts. And then let's also try to make sure we understand it by disproving other claims. And really that's how Torah was given. The famous two words was Nasev and Ishma, where the Jews, before even they were told what the Torah is about, they said, we will accept it because they accepted it on faith. If it's coming from God, we want it. And really it's important to understand Torah and to have logic. We're not, we're not um, um, weakening that, but even the logic, it has to be based on the idea of faith, which means even if we can't understand things, we still accept it on faith. We should strive to understand it to the best of our ability. Um, but we could see in the sequence of chapter one and two, that first chapter one is the facts of constant creation of, of God. And only in chapter two, then explaining it with disproving the heretics, you could see um, just an important order of how Torah works. Any questions? Okay. So philosophers were heretics, not as heretics? Not necessarily, but the the I guess you know we should bring up the words of how the Alter Rebbe refers to them. Not all philosophers, but the the Alter Rebbe. You know, let me pull up the words. It's been a while since I looked at the actual text. I was preparing this. Um, you know, the Alter Rebbe doesn't even refer to them as philosophers. He refers to them as uh, heretics. Okay. We have an intelligent response to heretics. To us a minute. Uh, so the, the word philosopher is my own, and it's not even in the Tanya, so I take that back. Heretics. We'll stick to that. Um, okay. Was this book collection English or Yiddish? Uh, so it was originally in, in Yiddish, right. basically the transcribed words, but then Rabbi Weinberg's sons actually translated it into so English. it's only in English. Yeah. Oh, no, it's like it has Hebrew and English. It's like a, oh, it's like a mix of both. Okay. Um, it's interesting, the Alter Rebbe, was adamant, sorry, the Rebbe was adamant that the Tanya classes on the radio should be text-based. He wanted all the words to be said, not only the idea. So that, that's really our class. I give it the, a general intro to that chapter, but then we actually learn it inside because understanding the text inside is also very important. Okay. Question, Rabbi. Sure. Um, did the um, phrase, if there's one question in Torah there'll be 10 answers um is that acceptable in Hasidus or is that just a cultural statement you never heard it before so I don't know I oh, can't answer well, I never even heard it I was really ex-husband so. <laughs> okay 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 so I'm going to tell it to you outside obviously when we learn it inside hopefully it'll be a lot clearer but I just want to give you the general um, uh, idea outside. So we'll get a taste for it, but hopefully when we learn it inside, it'll, all of it will come together a lot nicer. When a craftsman puts final touches on a utensil, so he's making a menorah, the utensil, the utensil doesn't need the craftsman to be present. Once the menorah is made, the craftsman could go on a walk, the menorah won't disappear. So the Alter Rebbe he says that the heretics, they misunderstand the concept of yesh me'ayin, of ex nihilo, of creating something from nothing, because they treat the creation of the world as if God is creating something from something. And therefore they said, God doesn't have to be involved in creation, just like a craftsman after making his work doesn't have to be involved in the craft anymore. And the Rebbe says that's, they they uh, they actually the, the Alter Rebbe quotes a verse from uh, somewhere in the Torah where it says he says their eyes were covered meaning they weren't looking properly they were they were almost in the dark and they misunderstand what it means to be something from nothing. <laughs> um, let me just quote the words inside. I'm just going to say quickly, you don't have to have the book in front of you. Um, let's just, I want to just quote the words. A similar, they mistakenly imagine in their minds a similarity between God's act of making heavens and earth and the work of man and his, and his schemes. The, 
In the case of human creative work, when a metal worker finishes the utensils, that utensil exists independently and no longer requires a metal worker's hands. For even the, when the metal worker's hands will cease to have any involvement with the vessel, and he will go off elsewhere in the marketplace, that utensil remains exactly the same. That is how those fools, the heretics, imagine that God made the heavens and earth. But their eyes, here, here's the words, it's from Isaiah. Their eyes are plastered over. And they fail to see the major distinction between the work of man, which is not real creation, but forming something from something, just a morphing of form and appearance from what initially is shaped as a chunk of silver to adopt the appearance of utensil. And they confuse this with God's making heavens and earth, which is genuinely something from nothing. So even though I didn't pull it up on the screen, I'm just taking a few of the paragraphs to explain to you that the Alter Rebbe brings the heretics claim that the creation of the world is not constant. It's just the same as a craftsman. And the Alter Rebbe dis disproves it by just saying that they were wrong because that's not genuine creation. Their way of creation is just morphing, taking something that was and just changing its form to something else. Real, genuine creation is taking what was nothing, or not taking, just making something from nothing. That's the Alter Rebbe's quote of the heretics and is disproving. Isn't nothing still something? So that's interesting. In, in, our, in our intro, we were, we were, we actually rephrased, and I'm just saying it loosely, but what we actually said is, nothing we take it as no thing like no. so it's really it's it's we need a better uh, word for it in hebrew it's ayin which means we translate it as nothing but it means um something a lot more like not not even zero because zero is could be close to one it's total nothingness oh, no. no there you go thank you that's a, a better translation for oh. loose translation i'm probably still going to say nothing to something just because that's how um, um, it's usually translated, but no would probably be a better translation. Uh, yes, Thomas. I keep thinking about this. <clears throat> Someone can correct me if I say something stupid, but um, I keep thinking about this from the physics perspective because they have matter and matter and antimatter. Yeah. And right. um, so, so nothingness isn't really nothingness in a way. If you right, keep exactly. The parts separated out. So. Exactly. So that's why there's a, a very good thank you, and and therefore yesh me ayin. Or the, maybe the Latin is better. Nihilo maybe means more than nothing. Ex, ex nihilo um, maybe is a better translation. I just, I think, was it, Lynn, did you translate ex nihilo for us um, um, recently, yeah. previously? Yeah, I don't know where my name and is. And it's fine. That's, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, okay, do, go ahead. Yes, Lynn. I do, I do have a question. So um, in... Bereshi in Genesis, uh, when God creates its bara, and he does use the word asa, but then there it's like there's now something to morph or to create. Would that help with seeing that the bara is something only God can do and we can asa, God can asa, we can asa? Would that help? I like that, meaning once there was already the baratious, once you already have the bara, then there could be the asiya, then there could be the making. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, interesting, just to, to add to it. So what Lynn is saying is the power of creation is only within the realm of God, uh, whereas the power of making uh, something from something else, we see that later on in the creation because that's you know taking what was and, and just making it something else. Interesting, the last word of the Kiddush, which is also taken from the opening chapters of Genesis, is Asher bara elokim lasot, that God created to make. And what's interesting is Rashi uh, uh, or some of the commentaries explain that God created it, but God created things imperfect in order for us to make it perfect. God created it, and our job is lasot. Rashi translated translates it as litaken to fix, to improve, to perfect, and that's really our job to take creation and make it um, uh, take ownership over it, make it perfect, make it ours. Um, okay, so that's the general idea of the first part of the chapter. But when Rabbi Weinberg in 19... Uh, sorry. When Rabbi Weinberg was preparing this class to teach on the radio, he didn't understand 
what the Alter Rebbe is disproving. The Alter Rebbe says that they're wrong, but he doesn't really say why. He just says they're wrong because they're looking at creation as uh, something from something, really something from nothing. But he doesn't like explain it other than just saying that they're wrong because it's something from nothing instead of something from something. <laughs> Let me get some water once. Oh, thank you, Shira. Perfect. <clears throat> Toda. I already made a bracha before. <clears throat> so what I want to do is the fact that the Alter Rebbe brings the heretic's claim, even though it's wrong and it's false and the Alter Rebbe disproves it, what we're going to try to do is almost put a, a heretic brain to understand where they were coming from and then and appreciate their place. And then it will give us a better appreciation of where the Tanya in chapter two is coming from to disprove it. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, so the Rabbi Weinberg was trying to understand what was the heretic's claim that the Alter Rebbe was disproving. One option is if they were just in the opinion that God is not really a creator, just an organizer, like a craftsman, which is creating something from something, then the Alter Rebbe is not really giving an explanation to counter their, their claim. He just brings their claim, and then he just says the Torah claim. He says that they claim it's yes, it's uh, something from something, yesh mi yesh. And the Torah says it's something from nothing, yesh mi ayin. So he's not really explaining why they're wrong. It would just mean th that's what they say, and this is what we say. So that, that doesn't sound correct of the Alter Rebbe to bring it and not really explain why they're wrong and only say that they are wrong because it's really something from nothing. So that's one way that Rabbi Weinberg asked the Rebbe, is this the way I should explain it on the radio? Another way of how it's explained is that they believed in yesh mi'ayin, meaning they believe that creation is something from nothing, but they just didn't believe that it's a quantum change. That it's a radical, um, a radical change. And I just want to, we're going to have to explain this a little more. When, when a person throws a stone in the air, which is the example we gave um, in chapter one, <clears throat> that the stone in the air is going against the nature of the stone. The nature of the stone pulled by gravity is to be resting on the ground or to be placed somewhere. For it to be thrown, there's a radical change happening to the stone. And that's similar to what happens in creation. There was nothingness. There was null. There was void. And there had to be a radical change for there to be a creation, to create something from nothing. So another way of how to learn, this is option two that Rabbi Weinberg brought to the Rebbe, was maybe the heretics, maybe they believed in create, creation, something from nothing, but they just didn't believe that it took a radical change to create something from nothing. Meaning that they rejected the idea of quantum change in creation. That was another way that was presented to the Rebbe of maybe that's the claim of the heretics. So again, just one way of how Rabbi Weinberg explained it is maybe they just didn't believe creation is something from nothing, and the Alter Rebbe is saying it is, um, and the Alter Rebbe is saying it is something from nothing. Another way is they believe that creation was something from nothing, but they just didn't believe the heretics didn't agree that it takes radical change to create something from nothing. So the Alter Rebbe, the, the Rabbi Weinberg asked the Rebbe, which one fits better? <clears throat> and 
And the Rebbe actually gave and explained that it's more nuanced. And here's my attempt of understanding the Rebbe's explanation. And hopefully in the practical Tanya, we'll understand this more at length. The reason why I say it's our attempt is because a lot of times the way the Rebbe would answer people's questions was, I don't want to say cryptic, but a lot of times the Rebbe, people would write a question, should I do this? And instead of the Rebbe answering yes or no, a lot of times the Rebbe's answer was actually just crossing out a word. So if there are, someone would ask the Rebbe, should I do this? The Rebbe would actually just cross out the word should. And then all that was left was I do this. Meaning it was the Rebbe's way of answering questions in a very short way. Or the Rebbe would circle, do this, like just circle those words. So without even putting a word, a lot of times the Rebbe would answer questions. Um, so the Rebbe gave, a, explained that it's more nuanced, meaning it's neither one or two. One option was they don't believe in creation, something from nothing. But then it doesn't really jibe in the Tanya because then the Alter Rebbe is not really answering their question. The Alter Rebbe just says, and we believe in something from nothing. It just, it's not really an explanation that the Alter Rebbe is giving. Another way is they believe in something from nothing, but they don't believe that it takes quantum change or radical change to create something from nothing. But that's not what the Alter Rebbe says in the words of the Tanya that I just quoted, where the Alter Rebbe says that their eyes were covered and they didn't understand that creation, they believe that creation was something from something. Even if it doesn't sound all clear yet, give me a chance to explain it. Um, and we'll also learn it inside. <laughs> the, the heretics, based on chapter two of Tanya, they accepted that creation is something from nothing. And they also accepted that there is a difference between quantum change and non-quantum change. They agree that for something to have quantum change, it needs constant energy to make that change. So for a rock to be thrown in the air, there needs to be that constant energy of the thrower in order for the rock to remain in the air. As soon as that energy leaves, that change of the rock from being a throwing rock to being a resting rock, that, that change is no longer there if the energy is no longer pulling it. So the quantum change, they agree, needs constant um, uh, cre uh, creation or constant change in order to make that, that uh, quantum change. But the heretics believed that our creation of the world, even though it came from nothing, it wasn't. It doesn't require a quantum change. And therefore, it doesn't require constant creation. So they believe it came from nothing. They just didn't believe that it took quantum change to, to make that something from nothing. And th the way they claimed it is they said that every day, we make change. I just changed a cup from being empty to a cup to being full or a cup from being on this side to a cup to being on this side. Every, every We're always changing. We're changing everything. We're manipulating things, moving things. But that's different than the change of a, of a stone from being resting to being throwing. The defining factor between a quantum change and not is when we are changing it, is it predictable for that change to happen or not? Is it sensible? Does it make sense when that change takes place? When we observe a change that's not quantum, that's not radical, it was over here and now we're moving it over there or it was... Um, um, a, a, blo a slab of metal slab of metal and now it's a menorah it's a predictable change to come forth 
even when it was just metal, it could lend itself to the idea of now being a candlestick or a menorah. If it was sensible for that change to happen, if it was predictable, then it's not a quantum change. Which means then it doesn't need constant mentorship. It doesn't need constant um, uh, supervision for it to remain in that change. So for a, a rock, it's not predictable for a rock to be thrown. But we, we see it all the time. But when it was when it's laying resting, that's the natural state. It's not something that is thrown. So for it to be thrown, it needs the constant energy of the thrower. So st flying stones that defies everything we know about stones. Stones, by nature, are pulled down by gravity. So for it to be thrown, it's defying the nature of it. That's a quantum change. And it needs con it needs constant um, uh, throwing energy in order for it to be thrown. The gravity doesn't allow the stone to be flying, so to bring it into motion, it needs a constant uh, a, a quantum change, and it needs to be constantly pulled in that direction. So the heretics, they say that when we look at the world now. We see it as a functioning, stable, predictable world. And even if we accept that the world was created new, it's still just like a craftsman taking something that was and making something else. It's just God actualizing the possibility to take from what was nothing to make it into something. But they didn't look at it as a quantum change. Even when it was nothing, it was still predictable for God to make something out of it. I need to reword this. I'm just I'm, I'm trying to throw out the idea there. I know it sounds a little bit, um, a little bit deep. They believe that God created the world from something, from from nothing into something. Yes, may I. But even when God brought the world something from nothing. It was predictable or sensible when it was nothing for there to be something that comes out. So therefore, it didn't require constant, it didn't, it's not a, a quantum change. And therefore, it doesn't require constant energy in creation. And that's where they were off. So they believed in the creation, something from nothing, but they didn't believe in quantum change. They looked at it as a craftsman that made from silver into a menorah. Whereas the way creation of the world really is, is more like that stone that in order to get it to, to throw, it needs that constant pull throwing energy. And as soon as the energy would leave, it would fall. So there's a quantum change happening to the stone and therefore it needs constant um, uh, energy in that change. So for God to create the world, it required constant, it requires constant um, uh, effort or energy because it's a quantum change and the heretics didn't believe in that qu quantum change of creation. Um, yeah, we'll take a question. I just want to finish this idea also. Yeah, but go ahead. Uh, yes, Mark, uh, Naomi. Uh, you're, yeah. um, when If they're called heretics, how come they're I'm not sure if they're saying this, but I'm, I'm hearing you saying that they believe that God uh, created something from nothing, but yet um, they don't believe that God is uh, constantly uh, creating after that. But why would they even use the word God if they don't believe in God? Or, or, or is it more that they just say there was a big bang or something and that's how very, it started? Very good. So I, well, that's beautiful, Naomi. And actually, in the um, author's um, in our translator, uh, Rabbi Miller, who translates the Practical Tanya, we'll see in the text. God willing, we'll learn next week. He will define the Torah um, definition of a heretic. A heretic actually believes in God. A heretic could believe in Torah. 
but they don't believe in the truth of the Torah. And we'll see what that means. So you're right, I'm using the word heretic just because that's the way the Alter Rebbe uses it. But God willing, next week, we're going to learn it inside. It's a little bit of a cliffhanger, but the, we'll, he'll bring the Rambam's definition of what heretic means. And um, and then I think it'll, that will make more sense. So I just want to finish with this idea. Um, the Alter Rebbe responds that you missed, tells the heretics that you missed the point. The basis of everything talked about was within the framework of human action. When we always deal with something from something, just changing the uh, formula, changing the framework, changing the, the form. It was a prior state and now it's this state. So it will remain predictable that you're able to change things. It allows the change to happen. So that's not quantum change. Um, if it if it doesn't allow the change to happen, if it's not predictable, then it's a quantum change. So the way they were looking at, at world creation was almost a predictable result from God being able to, to create. So it's a predictable, um, um, and therefore it's not quantum. What the Alter Rebbe is telling them is, it's yesh me'ayin, it's something from nothing, which means that it's it's not sensible, it's not predictable, and therefore requ it required quantum change to happen. And for quantum change to happen, it needs a constant um, 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 a change or a constant effort in order for it to happen. So unlike a craftsman who could walk away after it's made, God can't walk away from creation. And if he would, it would totally disappear and turn turn back to null and void because it needs that for quantum change, it needs that constant um, energy to create it. I know I explained it rather quickly um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting it in the text, um, but God willing next week, we'll learn it inside. Um, all right, we'll end today with that. Any questions before we conclude? I, I have a question on yeah. page seven, seven, let's see, page um, 32, uh, just under the seven, seven B it's talking about, and I don't know if this is next week talking about um, that. It, imagine that it could exist on its own without God. And then it talks about the reason why human creations exist without continual involvement of their creators. They are not really creations, but merely a shift in form with it in, pre-existing matter. Will we talk about hmm. that next week? Yeah, that's, exactly. that's powerful. Yeah, that's the yesh miyesh, exactly. Meaning it's um pre-existing form. That's beautiful. Yeah. So that God willing next week, that's going to be the I think the main theme. You can see it's a pretty deep topic from today's class, but hopefully when we learn it in the text and with the the translator of our text really did a good job explaining it, you know, slowly and and pretty elaborately. So hopefully next week we'll we'll get more um uh, clarity. Oh, All well, right. Uh, everyone. Another quick question. Does, sure. Um, I thought uh, Adam also meant from the earth. Is that correct or not? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, 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 the word in Hebrew for for um, earth. Actually, do you know? Let's uh, let's ask Lynn. Do you know how to say a potato in Hebrew, in in English? 